Good morning, and thank you for joining us here today. I hope everything is going well despite the COVID situation. Originally, we were supposed to meet in person at the Houston facility to view the Scanite demonstration, but plans change. So let's welcome Ocean It Spark Day and the subject of Scanite Smart Sensing Cement. For those of you who do not know, SPARC stands for Special Presentation of Advanced Research and Knowledge, which is a series of discussions that we host at OceanIt to share some of our cutting edge research. Today, we are very excited to discuss the development and scale up status of Scanite, which is a smart sensing cement for well integrity diagnostics. Scanite was developed with support from the U.S. Department of Energy. But before we get into the details of Scanite, we will hear from our founder and CEO, Dr. Patrick Sullivan, and our partners at Shell and the National Energy Technology Laboratory. After hearing from our guest speakers, we will go into the presentation, which will include a live demo at the Houston facility, followed by a Q&A session. I will now hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Vidu. The node, take it away. Okay, great. Before I guess, go further, let me give you a sense of who is on the call and what is the Spark Day about. There are roughly about 75 attendees today. Uh, these are only invited attendees. We have teams from super major oil companies and national oil companies, all major leading service companies, and a few independent operators. And of course, key people from Department of Energy, National Energy Technology Laboratory. Over the years, we have been working on pretty aggressively on the smart sensor technology, uh, which is Scanite. Over the last six or seven months, we have addressed the key challenges in the technology field deployment, which is manufacturing and scale up. Thanks to the support from the Department of Energy, we have taken care of that part as well. So now we are able to share the technology offering to the broader commu the industry community. So as I was sharing those input with the industry on the development so far, I felt serious interest from both from operators and service companies, and everyone was interested to see where the technology is now and how they could engage with us. So today, the plan is to give you a detailed view of Scanet uh, cement technology. As Paula mentioned, there are two parts of the, this webinar, presentations on the technical details and a live demonstration of a very unique manufacturing process that we were able to develop with the support from uh, Department of Energy. Before getting into the technical presentation, let's hear a few words from the captain of our ship, uh, Oceanet CEO, Dr. Patrick Sullivan, to welcome you all and provide a quick background on Oceanet. He's joining us from our corporate headquarters in Honolulu, Hawaii. So Paula, maybe you can uh, get him unmuted. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Welcome everybody to this um, interesting experiment, the Spark Day. We think during this type of um, pandemic, it's an opportunity for innovation. And so the idea of bringing you into the lab using these tools, I think is gonna be the way a lot of these things are done in the future. So thanks for being part of this experiment. I just wanted to share a little bit about some of the background here. The team that's working on this, or maybe stepping even further back, the technology that went into this really started, I think, quite a few years back with a lot of materials work, nanotechnology, in uh, work we did with Department of Defense. And then we've pivoted a lot of that, especially some of the sensing technology, into the energy uh, space. And this is really what you know, we call mind to market. So it started with these fundamental science ideas and we drove it into uh, different market applications. In this case, turning a casing into a sensor, a real application on digitization. And so we really appreciate you spending the time um, and we're happy to share with you how we've been bringing this along through this great collaboration. It's been um, a remarkable journey and the scale-up manufacturing piece, which I think they're going to spend a little time with, is one of the key things because you can't just do it in the lab. You've got to be able to produce it on scale. And the scale we're talking about is enormous, but they've really worked out these details. And so this, we think, is transformational and, again, reduces cost, improves reliability, and gives you information that would otherwise be inaccessible. So better economics better performance. 
want to thank everybody again. Uh, the, the concept, by the way, and how we do this innovation, we refer to as uh, intellectual anarchy. And uh, we have some material on this online, but it's an interesting process because it isn't really anarchy. It just is different than the way a lot of people innovate. So I encourage you to take a look at that and learn more. In the meantime, thanks again, Vinod and team, and, uh, and I'll uh, be participating in, in tracking this. So I'm going to sign off. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Pat. Um, really helpful. Um, if anybody's interested on the process of intellectual anarchy, actually, there is a book online, uh, Amazon, or any other platform that you use. You're welcome to ask the book. And then if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, continuing the, uh, the webinar uh, forward, let me introduce a very special guest here. Uh, it is my honor to introduce a special guest, Hani El Shahabi from Shell. Uh, let me give you a quick background on how this um, scanner work relates to Shell. Early on in the development process, Shell identified the potential and invested in the technology development process and accelerated the process and continued to push the effort forward and continue to support uh, the effort. This unique collaboration is not only in scanner but on already commercialized technology platforms such as the Kisimen Steel um, Interfacial Nano Bond Skin Technology which we deployed um, with the co corporate core development exercise with Shell in the Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico assets. And ongoing efforts on subsea laser communications is called ULTRA. Again, the D Department of Energy is also a big part of that process. So today we have requested Hani to give you a perspective on the scanner technology based on already published collaborative works between Oceanet and Shell. I'm sure his talk will set on the background for today's webinar. I know that Hani is a very familiar name in the oil and gas technical community. Um, he's highly regarded and don't need much of an introduction to the oil and gas community, at least in here in Houston. But before I hand over to Hani, I think I should formally introduce him to you. So Hani El Shahavi, currently the deep water digitalization lead at Shell. Um, he has 30 plus years of um, industry experience, 15 years um, at Schlumberger in different positions. He served in about 10 countries, starting from field management, marketing, sales, and product development. I think right now he's about 18 years at Shell. Um, he has been in different positions, starting from deep water technology and strategy lead, game changer involvement, deep water digitalization lead. Um, he is also the Shell's principal technical expert for formation testing and sampling. There's about 10 plus patents and so many technical publications, about one, 150 plus publications. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, he's very actively involved in the OTC, IEEE, SPE, and all these communities that is related to and supporting the oil and gas industry. So with that, um, thank you so much, Hani, for for you know, committing your time and uh, would be great if you could give an insight on an industry's perspective on um, the importance of smart cement and um, the role of a technology like scanning. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Vinod. Uh, really appreciate that and uh, <clears throat> honored to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you all about this really interesting technology. What you can see on the um, um, bottom right here, uh, this is moving through what happens when you get changes in stress state in the subsurface and how that might affect either the integrity of a well and or the communication between the well through the cement sheath to existing pre-existing faults or reactivated faults. So um, cement is really a key uh, ingredient in uh, guaranteeing uh, the integrity of a well, both from the construction side through the entire operational phase of the well, all the way to uh, decommissioning. So it's it's about zonal isolation, it's about protecting the casing and actually mechanically supporting it. But we often forget sometimes is that it's there for life, not just during the construction of the well. So uh, the wells, you know, through their life, may experience structural instability or breach integrity either through due to subsidence or compaction 
which is caused by reservoir depletion. And what you see here in the animation is resulting from that. So as you deplete, in this particular case, zones that are located uh, below you, where your well is, because you have production from other wells, which was really the rationale for why we originally developed this technology, was to look at the effect of stress underneath uh, to ensure that you do not communicate to pre-existing faults, but also as a means of monitoring long-term the integrity of the, uh, of the isolation of the well. It turned out though, when we were developing this, that one of the side benefits, very important one though, uh, of Scanite is that it actually improves cement mapping and monitoring even during the original uh, emplacement. In other words, even without the need of monitoring, which was really the rationale for development, uh, uh, the primary evaluation uh, benefits uh, 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 and the ability to map the cement um, more definitively is a side benefit of smart cements like this because it's a much more definitive demarcation between what is good cement and what is a contaminated cement or what is the absence of cement. And I think you're going to see some more details on that in the later presentations. <laughs> Finally, I wanted to mention a big driver actually as we speak now that will increase the need for this type of technology even more is <clears throat> the uh, enhanced or accelerated focus on carbon, car uh, carbon capture and sequestration, which makes um, you know, this integrity monitoring even more critical because with carbon capture and sequestration and the conversion of either existing wells or the construction of new wells to use them in that manner, long, very long-term containment is essential. And monitoring that containment through the lifetime, which is usually decades of your wells, in a CCS project is that much more critical compared, for example, to um, containment uh, for oil and gas production. Another important driver, uh, of course, is the end of life, decommissioning and abandonment. And, and, and the abandonment, uh, abandonment and decommissioning are costly, okay? So if you wanna take one example in the Shell Brent field, you know, that's, that's the one famous Brent field after which the Brent crude is named, the blend, um, Shell spent over a billion dollars to dismantle four rigs and, and uh, you know, the wells that go with it. So it's a costly exercise. It's also not a money generating exercise. So most of the time, uh, companies try and postpone that if they can, because the more you postpone it, of course, the less of an impact it has on your uh, budget cycles. But um, where we are in the oil industry as a whole, either with companies that are shrinking, divesting, or with transition to new energies potentially around accelerating, is that the abandonment and decommissioning liability is actually increasing and becoming that much more uh, critical. And because of that, then uh, uh, understanding the cement integrity, where do you cut, how do you recover casings, becomes also a potentially big driver for smart cement. Um, uh, the, I mentioned earlier the repurposing, potential repurposing for wells, of wells for CCUS as a, as kind of a, 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 an alternative for abandonment. So with that too, you need that much uh, better improvement of the late life cement map. And uh, smart cements allow you to do that. Uh, and, and finally, you know, the whole push towards sustainability uh, uh, um, is, is really driving technological innovation in areas such as nanotechnology, material science, and digital twin technologies, because that allow you to understand things without actually conducting physical experiments and or use less material to do the same function uh, and or be able to recycle uh, uh, materials that are used in structures because of the uh, scarcity that is uh, really around the corner for a lot of uh, premium um, or rare minerals. Um, I just wanted to highlight the importance of carbon capture and sequestration and how key it is to, for companies and for countries to be able to achieve the COP21 ambitions. So 
that goes with all the other things that have to happen, operational efficiency, you know, uh, the shift towards natural gas, renewable power, biofuels, electric mobility, all of that. And you still need uh, natural things and uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration to play the role because all of the others that I mentioned are just not enough, okay, to meet those goals in any credible scenario you can think of. And, so, and carbon capture sequestration is particularly interesting because it's also very pertinent to the oil and gas industry. It's, a, it's the most obvious way to repurpose its already existing skills, uh, whether it's you know, human resources, whether it's skill sets, and whether it's engineering at scale, all those things become much more pertinent for carbon capture and sequestration, for example, than they are for electric mobility or for um, you know uh, generation of renewable power. You know, it's a it's a long shot and a big stretch for most companies to go there. But CCS is actually uh, very very much uh, uh, similar to oil and gas. I I just want to before I close emphasize the fact that the smart cements are exactly that. Uh, like uh, Scanite. It's also a smart tool. So it's not just about ensuring primary cement integrity or just monitoring the state of things along the life cycle all the way to decommissioning, the state of stress and so on. But it's importantly a way of sensing the changes in your near wall bore and it's a proxy into the reservoir. That is important because in, in the world of digitalization, where I've been focusing my attention, it's that interplay between sensing and data gathering, uh, and then using those uh, data to um, gather insights, and then operating differently, and finally, you know, extracting maximum value from your physical assets. That's how digital transformation occurs. And a key concept of that is this concept of the digital twin. The idea of marrying data with your physical system and integrating the two so that you have basically a faithfully replicating uh, uh, cyber model of your physical asset. And uh, things like uh, Scanite really allow you to do that. And they allow you to do that relatively seamlessly and with little uh, upfront investment and with little risk of obsolescence. So uh, I'll leave it at that as a seed setting. Hopefully this gives you an idea of why we were interested in Scanite and why we've been in it for the long haul, why I personally uh, spent um, a lot of time thinking about the multitude of uses in which this technology can, uh, can uh, make a difference in our business. And uh, yeah, hopefully in the rest of this presentation, you'll get a glimpse of the, those possibilities. So thank you very much for your attention and. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity again. Thank you very much, Hani. So that sets the background really clear. I thank you for doing that. I know that you have lots of stuff going on, but I thank you for taking the time. Now, let me introduce um, uh, Mr. Bill Fincher. Uh, he's the Federal Program Manager, Technology Development and Integration Center, Oil and Gas National Energy Technology Lab, uh, US Department of Energy. So before I, I, I hand over to Bill, uh, the Department of Energy, DOE, NETL Labs, the headquarters, I mean, the Houston facility here, I think the office is in Sugarland now, they've been supporting the current effort in scale-up and manufacturing and testing very actively. This program is very interesting in that this is a SBIR program that they're funding under, under, but it is actually driven to um, rapid commercialization activity. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to sincerely thank the DOE headquarters. Some of the folks, they couldn't make it, they sent me a note, NETL and DOE Sugarland office. I believe, I think Roy Long is uh, here online as well, for the continued support in taking the disruptive innovation to the market. Okay, I just wanted to take this time. I really appreciate you uh, involving me in this. I know we work very closely on uh, these projects and the multiple awards that we have in our program together. Um, i just like to just talk a little bit about how the award was, uh, what FOA came out of and how it fits the mission and our continued mission. So at the time of the, this particular release, one of the DOE uh, interests on the SBIR platform and in our extramural program to some extent was pursuing projects that uh, would focus on technologies that really could 
looking to assist industry in both enhance wellbore integrity and, and more quickly and cost effectively assessing the integrity of uh, both the casing and cement barriers to subsurface flow in the wellbore. Um, so this basis, uh, as we all were aware, this came out of an FY18, so around this time, um, the basis of this need really stemmed out of a uh, uh, dramatic increase in total number of production wells, gas wells often horizontal wells, deep, deep reservoir and populated areas that could require increased uh, vigilance uh, on part of the industry and to help ensure wellborn integrity is maintained short and long term. So our focus was looking at uh, technologies uh, that could meet this need um, through cement and, uh, and such. So uh, it's very interesting as you look back at, at writing FOAs and, and you see how sometimes projects line up very well with some statements. Uh, one of the statements per the language was beyond state-of-the-art research that could lead to game-changing impacts were considered uh, more responsive to the solicitation based on the FOA uh, than research for small incremental advances because we really we wanted to get into this game quickly and, and see results. And this project uh, developed under this, uh, this technology development, this, techno this project, excuse me, is thus far proven successful to fit this descriptor. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, and, and I know there's some exciting stuff coming up, so I don't want to keep all your time. And I'm actually very excited in, in seeing this demo myself, because I would hope to have been there, but because of COVID-19 and travel restrictions and such, we're not. So I really want to thank Oceanet for uh, putting this, uh, this Spark uh, idea together. I think it's going to really enhance other programs we have together, other projects, excuse me. And I, I look forward to, to doing this again in the future. But our continued support of Ocean Nets Acoustic Cement uh, SBI award for use in advanced wellborn integrity and zone isolation monitoring is just it's directly related to these technologies focus on meeting the original intent of the FOA. I mean, we are right on point uh, for what uh, when we were writing the original language um, and we're lucky to be there. Uh, we look forward to future the, the future deployment testing of the acoustic smart cement technology with industry. Uh, and, and really, what can be learned about well cement integrity and formation geomechanics and, and, and to its part to help meet our goals and in improving uh, production and efficiency and safety. So I look forward to working with Oceanet and, and to see this, this award through, through completion and uh, you know, discussing any other avenues we can within the SBI award or beyond to uh, see this technology uh, make the gap and, and become commercialized. So that's all I have today. Thank you very much, Vinod and all, for uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk. Well, thank you so much, um, Bill, and the uh, entire NATL DOE team for the continued support on and these activities in our journey to take this technology to the market. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Jacob Pollock. Um, he is actually the brain behind uh, the scanner uh, smart cement technology and leading this technology forward as a product. Uh, he closely collaborated um, in the beginning with Shell, uh, with actually other four um, uh, major operators as well, and then found a way to bring the technology to the market quicker than going through all the details of actually coming up with a new logging tool and all the other details that is involved in deployment. So uh, Dr. Pollock is a material technical lead at Oceanet and directs also a number of other projects related to mechanical and acoustic metamaterials at Oceanet. Um, he has um, recently been developing advanced sensing material for all the gas applications beyond scanite. Um, and it's much more for the broader perspective of um, digital, um, digital oil or digital well perspective. Um, just a quick background on his educational uh, background. Uh, he has, Jacob has obtained undergraduate uh, and PhD from UC Berkeley, and he's been with Oceanet for 10 plus years now. All right, thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm excited to tell you about a product that we've been developing in collaboration with our industry partners and the Department of Energy, and that is Scanite, our acoustic sensing cement for advanced well integrity diagnostics. So we'll start off with a little bit of background, which I like to thank Hani for covering so very well. And uh, we'll just review some of that briefly. But why do we care about well integrity? It provides the zonal isolation, sealing, sealing and protection, as well as support of uh, casing materials. And cement is a critical and integral part of this well construction that provides the uh, well integrity. 
Furthermore, beyond the uh, uh, insulation and construction, cements and wells can experience uh, instability and uh, due to subsidence and compaction caused by reservoir depletion. So it's important not only to know where the cement is placed, but how it responds and uh, develops stresses throughout these changes in the reservoir and uh, changes in geomechanics. And uh, more generally, uh, knowledge of cement placement and integrity can improve well construction design and, uh, and processes. And the top right, you see uh, the complexity of a modern deep water oil field, and which uh, emphasizes the importance of the field integrity. And the bottom right, you can see a contaminated water well uh, due to migration of hydrocarbons into the aquifer, uh, likely due to poor zonal isolation. And furthermore, uh, well integrity and cement integrity in particular become very important in decommissioning operations uh, for plug and abandonment, as well as storage for carbon capture and sequestration. So recently a federal program was introduced to plug nearly half a million orphaned and abandoned oil and gas wells. And this would create 120,000 energy sector jobs as well as cut methane emissions. And it's estimated that up to 3 million, 3 million orphaned and abandoned wells are in the U.S. that need to be uh, decommissioned at a cost of $20,000 to $145,000 per well. This is also important in offshore wells. Uh, so it's estimated that a billion dollars per year will be spent over the next, years, next five years for abandonment in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Uh, these can cost up to $10 million per well in deep water wells and half a million dollars per well in shallow wells. And it's estimated that worldwide by 2030, over $104 billion will be spent on offshore abandonment. Furthermore, modern wells are deeper, longer, and higher pressure, which increase the abandonment costs and can reach many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Also, uh, during carbon capture and storage, the uh, integrity of the cement barrier ensures the uh, storage capacity and uh, prevents uh, leakage from the reservoir. So this is part of a broader challenge, which is uh, to en enable intelligent wells. And so improved sensing and more data are required to truly realize unified digital oil field in the future. Also, service companies are looking for products that can uh, sustain recurring revenue streams. So the product solution here is uh, real-time integrity monitoring uh, and, uh, and also offering a product for recurring monitoring service. service. Um, these, this material can be easily read using existing uh, acoustic logging tools, and it can be used to determine cement integrity, contamination, and mechanical loading on the cement. So this results in improved determination of cement placement, discrimination between fluids and, and lightweight cements, uh, monitoring of formation, depletion, and reservoir compaction, and increased knowledge generally of well bore mechanical stress states in the oil field. This is where our, our acoustic sensing cement scanite comes in. And the concept here is that you input an uh, acoustic signal and listen to the resulting uh, output acoustic signal to determine uh, where the cement is present and some information about its environment, whether that's chemical or mechanical uh, environment. And how this works is we've created acoustic metamaterial particles that are, that are added at low level to well cements, including lightweight and foam cements. And what this additive does is imparts a metamaterial effect that's referred to as an acoustic band gap in which uh, the acoustic um, impedance increases greatly with only within a certain range of frequencies. So this can be used to specifically identify the material. This, sh this slide shows an example concept of operations with a vertical cemented well. And this uses a simple monopole logging tool uh, to map the frequency response of the cement as a function of depth. And in this color plot here, you can see uh, the frequency response as a function of depth where we see a, a decrease in the band gap region, decrease in the amount of acoustic transmission in the band gap region. And by looking at the location of this band gap and the amplitude of this band gap, we can create, in this case, a one-dimensional map of the cement presence and stress state. Now we'll show a brief animation 
illustrating this example concept of operation. So again, we're gonna look at a simple vertical cemented well and using a wireline tool to map uh, one dimensionally the cement uh, stress state and uh, integrity presence. So as we scan up with the tool, we see the band gap indicating the scan is present. In, a, in an area of high stress, this band gap is shifted and we can determine the actual degree of mechanical stress in that region. Furthermore, when voids are encountered, the band gap disappears and we can determine the size and location of defects in the cement. And again, this uses uh, traditional bond logging tools or more advanced uh, acoustic logging and detection tools. So uh, I'd like to go back a little bit and talk about the predecessor of Scanite, which is our Nanite smart sensing cement. And this was developed with the Department of Energy, uh, where we formed a joint industrial partnership with uh, Shell, Hess, ConocoPhillips, and Aramco uh, to develop this smart sensing cement for a well integrity determination. And in this case, we combine smart materials with detection methods and data analysis that can provide a complete system for well integrity monitoring. And this is similarly what we've done with our new development, the Scanite. So Nanite is actually using the nanomaterial admixture that's added to well cement and imparts electrical sensing capabilities and improved mechanical properties. So by using electrical impedance spectroscopy, we can determine the mechanical stress state in the ad admixture added cement. We developed multiple annular models to test this system for detecting voids and mechanical stress in a cement cemented annular structure. Furthermore, we developed this technology for weigh and motion measurements, where we're measuring ax axle weights of vehicles, in this case, trucks moving at speed uh, down the road across these cement sensors. However, we realized with this uh, electrical sensing technology that we have, we have actually have some issues with deployment due to the difficulties of creating a wired casing and um, resistivity measurements in general. So we looked at if we wanted to move to an acoustic mode. Uh, which is common in the oil field, as well as other types of non-destructive testing. Uh, and fortunately, Ocean has quite a bit of experience in developing acoustic metamaterial products for various applications. So examples of these products include our EPA-certified level-dependent earplugs. And these were developed uh, with support from DARPA and the Marines in order to create an, an, ear, an earplug that allowed for situa situational awareness while providing hearing protection. So in this case, we used vertically aligned carbon nanotubes to create acoustic metamaterials with frequency and amplitude dependent response. So in this case, you can hear a low level continuous noise well, uh, such as a, a surrounding conversation or an approaching vehicle, but if a gunshot goes off near your head, your hearing is actually protected. And the top right shows modifications we've made to a hard uh, dive helmet in order to reduce noise and prevent hearing damage for uh, surface supplied divers. And we used a variety of material um, developments and aeroacoustic principles to modify this to greatly reduce the level of noise inside the helmet during operation. Also in the bottom right, we're developing uh, next generation ear seal that use uh, mechanical and acoustic metamaterials to improve the seal, comfort, and noise reduction rating of over-the-ear headset. And again, these use repeating arrays uh, with specific structures to impart specific mechanical and acoustic properties. So in developing Scanite, um, a cement composite, we, used, uh, we started with acoustic modeling and simulation in order to determine what structures would be ideal and how to control the uh, acoustic properties of these materials. So we started with a unit cell model you can see in the upper left and did harmonic and transient acoustic uh, 
acoustic analysis that showed this acoustic band gap response where there's greatly reduced sound transmission at specific frequencies. And we, we furthermore, we converted the um, unit cell model into both mechanical properties that we incorporated into a well bore model in order to determine the effect on logging tools. So what we found here is that we could actually tune this band gap by controlling the physical and mechanical properties of particles added to the cement and it provided design handles for engineering this unique material. So we actually started to produce some of these materials that we had designed computationally, and we produced them at small scale in the lab and started to make cement composites from them, as well as steel cement composites with the added uh, acoustic metamaterial particles. And here we did uh, vibration analysis. We started with vibration analysis to determine the acoustic band gap effect and confirmed our uh, modeling results where we get a strong change in uh, transmission loss at a specific frequency. And the top right shows where we moved to doing some ultrasonic testing, sonic and ultrasonic testing um, using transducers. And in this case, we tried uh, larger cement composites and in various conditions, under various conditions with different types of particles and again confirm that acoustic band gap effect uh, in the region that we had uh, predicted. So this uh, is just shows our one of our current setups for larger scale ultrasonic and sonic testing, at, where we have a source and receiver transducer and a fairly simple uh, pass through um, setup. But we've also done testing with uh, pitch, not only pitch catch, but also um, echo uh, measurement. So this just shows some of the results where we're looking at the acoustic transmission versus the frequency. And in this case, uh, control cement at the same density is uh, shown in blue compared to uh, scanite uh, acoustic properties that are shown in orange. And here we see a great de decrease in the acoustic transmission here between 20 and 30 kilohertz. And then on the right shows how we can control this acoustic band gap effect by changing the uh, particle properties and structure and shift the band gap into different regions of the frequency domain. So we've done a lot of this analysis at uh, lower frequencies in order to match um, simple monot monopole acoustic logging tools and cement bond log tools. However, we're also interested in the higher frequency responses so if we can engineer uh, acoustic band gap in the hundreds of kilohertz, that would be more useful for uh, high, more high resolution ultrasonic tools for cement analysis. And here we can see uh, in dark blue is the control cement and in light blue is the uh, scanite cement showing the gap between them, uh, which indicates that band gap effect and de decrease in transmission. Uh, and on the right shows the difference in the transmission loss as a, fun as a function of frequency. Not only did we detect this acoustic band gap effect, but we actually saw a change in the acoustic band gap response upon mechanical loading. And this was really exciting for us because uh, of the concept that Hani described, essentially turning the entire cemented wellbore into a uh, strain sensor. And on the left shows um, setup for testing in the laboratory in a mechanical testing uh, system with ultrasonic transducers. And the right shows some of the shift in acoustic response with increased mechanical loading. So we also took these um, structures that we built. Some of them were just cement composites. Other were cement composites behind steel sheeting. And we took them out to do some subscale testing uh, in a, uh, a semi-submerged environment. And um, here, I, these are poorly labeled, I apologize, but the uh, waterfall plots on the top right of that figure show in order from left to right, uh, control cement, uh, water void to the right in the center, and scanite cement on the right. And here we can see there's a much greater distinction between the scanite cement and the void than there is between traditional cement and the void. And this is largely due to this acoustic band gap uh, shown uh, in the blue and purple colors that occurs in this case between 10 and 20 kilohertz. So this matched well with a uh, monopole acoustic logging tool that we acquired that had a center frequency around 20 kilohertz. 
And so we also did some, uh, we did some pre-pilot logging uh, where we built a structure using uh, actual cement mixer, a larger amount of particles, and the acoustic logging tool. And on the top right here, what we see is the uh, acoustic re response in the frequency domain. And on the left is uh, control cement. Uh, in the center is scanite cement. And on the right is the difference between those. So in the region that we're looking at, there, there's a large difference between the scanite and control cement, again, in this specific uh, frequency range. So with these results, we wanted to go to a larger pilot field study. And in this case, we constructed two 40-foot long pipe constructs uh, with engineered voids at the same locations with specific sizes and um, positions. Uh, we, we cemented the annulus of one with scanite and cemented the annulus of the other pipe construct uh, with traditional cement at the same density, in this case, about 12 pounds per gallon. And what we, how we constructed these is we uh, centralized a steel casing pipe within a PVC pipe and then pumped cement uh, up through the annulus uh, for each pipe. And on the right shows the uh, monopole full wave long triple sonic logging tool uh, that we use that's uh, actually designed for swim well bores and uh, has one transmitter and three spaced out receivers. So these pipes were buried at a shallow angle and logged uh, using the monopole logging tool. And on the left, you can see the three receivers uh, response to the control and composite cement. So these are the DBL logs. And highlighted are the regions of uh, voids that were uh, created for the engineered defect. And on the right shows the frequency response to the control and composite samples, where we can see an indication of the void size and location, even down to the uh, small six inch void that we uh, imparted into the um, pipe construct. So one reason that we buried these at a shallow angle was so that we could actually apply load and test uh, in, the, in the field here, uh, the frequency response to increase loading. And we can see that this uh, contrast and resolution does not occur for um, the cement with the out the additive metamaterial particle. And here again, we're looking at the frequency response uh, for the control and uh, scanite cement uh, for the three receivers. And uh, here we typically look at the third receiver uh, through which the sound has to travel the most cement. And what we can see here is a clear signal from the acoustic cement, as well as a band gap at the lower region. And we'll look at that in a little more detail. Um, again, uh, between 10 and 20, 10 and 15 kilohertz uh, for a tool that has a center frequency of 20 to 25 kilohertz. So then if we look at regions for the intact pipe with no voids and look at the frequency domain, we can look at the difference between the scanite response and the control response. And this difference gives a clear indication of this acoustic band gap effect around 10 kilohertz. And we also looked at, because we are, have three receivers and a full waveform detection, we can also look at semblance logs that show the arrival times of the various uh, acoustic waves. And what we see on the right for the acoustic smart cement is a stronger, later first arrival, which is much clearer. So this uh, acoustic frequency response definitely demonstrated the band gap behavior we had seen in the lab. And we also were able to excavate a small region of the pipe, of the pipe construct, and apply bending load uh, to see what the effect of loading is on this acoustic band gap. And we see that what happens is it actually decreases and shifts the acoustic band gap um, based on the level of loading. So we uh, went to, back to the field and, uh, one, and tested these three loading conditions for uh, both the uh, cemented scanite pipe and the control cemented pipe at the same formulation. Uh, and here we applied three types of loading, flexural bending, radial compression, as well as smooth ground loading. The top left shows the bending loading where we uh, use a frame to um, actually be, uh, impose bending load on the pipe. And we used a strain gauge to confirm uh, these deformations. And what we see is when we look in the region of loading, 
we can see uh, distribution of stress around the bench region, as well as an increase in a stress with increased deformation. On the bottom left, we see our radial compression loading, where this time we use ratchet straps to sim simply squeeze the pipe. And here in the very region uh, that we applied this radial, this radial compression loading, we saw a shift in the uh, acoustic band gap effect, uh, indicating the uh, position and degree of loading, which we did not see for the control scene. Finally, we did through ground loading where we installed pilings through the ground onto the pipe and uh, jacked up a truck over them to apply loading in one position or the other. And we were able to distinguish where we were loading these samples based on our logging results. So the big challenge, one big challenge here has been the scale up. So we started off making uh, small particles uh, by hand molding, molding in different uh, uh, setups and uh, moved on to a pan coating setup where we could produce uh, larger batches for the pilot field study, but it was still a pretty slow process. And that's brought us to our current uh, manufacturing uh, process. And uh, you can see that here. Uh, we didn't show uh, a lot of the development here where we actually went from making all these various types of particles to the pan coating method where we ended up at our uh, pilot scale production uh, where we're at now. And throughout the process of scale up, we've continued to improve the quality, the yield, the production rate, and to decrease the size of these high quality uh, multi-layered particles. And so now we're gonna go to our production facility where Sumil Thapa, our technology deployment lead, will show you part of the particle manufacturing process to develop them, uh, to make the materials I just described. Hi, okay. So this is our Houston facility. Uh, so I'm gonna be speaking about the work that we've been doing to develop the actual manufacturing process and how we scaled it up from the laboratory to what we have here in Houston in our Houston field facility. So uh, one of the big things to note is, you know, when we did early development in Hawaii with Jacob and the team in our laboratories in Honolulu, is we were doing laboratory scale production and it was good enough to make the material for initial testing and proof of concept. But to do these larger field trials and to do more extensive testing and demonstration, we had to scale up the process. In addition to that, we had to develop the process so that, you know, it was a process that could be scaled into full scale production. The laboratory model for producing the materials wasn't going to scale. So what we did here in Houston is spend a lot of time working with equipment manufacturers and developing a process that would be scalable. And so what you hear, see here behind me is a, a piece of equipment that is based off of kind of standard industrial equipment for producing uh, particles that have been coated, but we had to modify the machine and the process um, to be able to produce these materials that you see in front of me right here. So what I have here is an example of some material that we produce here at our Houston facility. So this is a fine grade scan out material. And then next to it, I have some examples of different grades. So we can make a range of different sizes and grades of materials. We also change the different properties and can customize the formulation in terms of layer buildup. Uh, it's a multi-layer structure. So we do a lot of those kind of optimization and changing the material properties based on our production process. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this core material in our machine. It's a larger size core so that it'd be more easily visible on this web demonstration. Um, and so I am going to move this out of the way. And so that you can see close up to our machine. So this is our, our meta material production system. And basically the concept here is we load the machine with the core materials and we fluidize it with airflow and then we spray on our add-on material to build our meta material structure. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to go ahead and open this chamber and I'm going to tip it over. So you can see that we've preloaded this material with some of that core. And I'm going to close this up. 
And uh, I'm going to apologize just as a warning. There may be some loud noises as I close up this machine. Okay, so we have the machine closed up. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on the airflow and you'll see the particles start to fluidize in that chamber. So I'll put some light on that machine. And as the airflow begins, you'll see it fluidizing. And so this is a very key part of the process. Um, this is one step in a multi-step process to make the final product. But for the fluidization, this makes sure that we can get an even uniform coating and uh, when we do our spray on and that the particles do not agglomerate. That was actually a big struggle in our process development is how do we get a uniform material to give us a clean acoustic uh, response and prevent agglomeration. So now that the, the material is fluidized, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the spray and this is how we build up and we're gonna do a close up of the machine. And so you can see what it looks like. So as the, the material is fluidized, we have a nozzle here that's inside this chamber. So here's the chamber and I'm gonna just zoom in. And so that nozzle will spray our add-on material. And we use a various uh, different types of polymers and different add-on materials, depending on uh, what material we wanna use and what kind of acoustic response we want in our metamaterial. So we can, it's a highly customizable process and you can see the, as before that we use different grades and we can build different structures. So now I'm gonna bring this camera back out. I'm gonna actually stop the process now and just be aware that I'm gonna lower this chamber and there's gonna be some loud noises coming up. Okay, and I'm gonna just take a sample of this material. And so for this demonstration, what we did was we took this, we started with these large, large diameter cores that start off pristine white and we applied a blue kind of layer to, to that material. So if you can zoom in and so you can see that there's a slight blue tint and that's basically the, the add-on that we've applied to this material and you can see that it's fairly uniform in color. Um, and that, that was part of a big part of our process in terms of optimization and developing a process that would give repeatable, clean, precise material production. Um, so that's, that's kind of the basic idea and concept of how we uh, produce material on this larger scale. And Jacob will talk about how we'll develop, how we can scale to a, a full scale production system. Um, and like we said before, ideally we would, we would be doing this demo live in person with you folks over here with us. Um, unfortunately, that's not currently the case, but whenever we get to that state, we welcome you to come visit our facilities and we'd love to demonstrate all of this uh, live and in person when that's possible. So I'm going to hand it over back to Jacob. All right. Thank you so much, Samil Thapa, for that demonstration. Um, so as Samil was describing, um, this process allows us to uh, control the layer thickness for even very fine layers. And this also allows us to control the overall particle density. So in this case, we match the overall particle density to that of the cement slurry in order to get even distribution and prevent settling. So that's another uh, design handle we have on these materials. Besides the acoustic response is the size and the density of the particles. And the, with the process that uh, was just shown in our facility, one of the reasons we actually chose this was not only uh, to scale up in a batch process, but to convert it to a continuous process in order to make enough of this material to meet field trial demands as well as market demands. And as has been mentioned before, uh, the COVID uh, delays have definitely impacted due to travel and uh, um, other elements, as we all know. Um, but we continue our scale-up efforts, and uh, those have looked quite promising. We're actually moving forward with the scale-up trial 
uh, for production in uh, Germany. So just to uh, wrap up a little bit with uh, some of the uh, applications and tools that we're looking at for the Scanite Smart Cement. These include the uh, ones that I mentioned about zonal isolation for safety and efficiency during production, but also include uh, channeling microannulus and fractures. And this may be particularly useful for lightweight and foam cements, which are often difficult to distinguish from surrounding wellbore fluids. Uh, we are also definitely interested in radial mapping uh, using different types of tools and multi-annual inspection, which can be particularly important for plug and abandonment. Uh, we're interested in defining the geomechanical and well mechanic uh, information that's going on uh, for producing well, as well as uh, stress detection and pressure monitoring in general in the cement. And for deployment, we're looking at uh, wireline tools, as well as more uh, continuous remote monitoring tools. So for wireline logging, we've been looking uh, largely at monopole for our uh, pilot field study. We're also looking at dipole, array tools, scanning tools, which include the ultrasonics, deep shear wave imagers, and EMAT systems. And uh, other ideas for deployment include monitoring uh, through surface excitation of the pipe, as well as fiber optic distributed acoustic sensing to determine continuously the uh, acoustic properties and mechanical stress state of the cement and its integrity. Also, uh, considering things like smart balls and probes that could be used to interrogate the cement using acoustic means, with the ultimate goal of being long-term, real-time, continuous monitoring. So, to talk about our next steps and some of the conclusions, we've demonstrated that this uh, Scanite Smart Cement provides improved uh, cement void contrast and allows for stress detection that's not uh, uh, present without this uh, additive. The acoustic band gap effect and load dependence were demonstrated on multiple levels, ranging from the lab through our pilot field study. And we're very excited to take it to full scale field studies for particular applications. And we demonstrated that it has the potential to enhance well integrity diagnostics, as well as provide insight into subsurface mechanics. In the future, uh, the very near future, we're continuing our uh, production process scale up as well as optimizing our material and detector systems for specific applications. And to facilitate uh, the commercialization, we're looking for partnerships and field trials to demonstrate the uh, capabilities of this Scanite technology. So the next steps in the mind to market journey for Scanite include field deployments and case studies, uh, target applications and concept of operations development, as well as non-interventional uh, methods of monitoring cement from the surface. And on that, I'll uh, conclude this part of the presentation. I want to give special thanks to the U.S. Department of Energy and the National Energy Technology Lab, particularly uh, Bill Fincham, as well as Shell Oil Company and the support from Hani El Shahawi in particular. And on that, I will pass it back to Dr. Vidu to lead the question and answer session. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Sumil, for a great job and presentation and live demonstration. I see that there are lots of questions are here. Um, throughout the process, people have been typing questions. So the first question is that, do you have a sense of um, scan, how Scanite responds through multiple casing strings and annuli? Have you tested that? Right, so that's a very good question and it's something that we're excited to explore. Uh, we've actually just been mainly looking at the uh, first casing so far but there's a strong potential to do multi-annual inspection due to the ability to tune the acoustic properties of the smart cement. So we can actually develop kind of different flavors that have uh, acoustic response at different frequency ranges that will allow us to see through the cement. It's transparent at particular frequencies, but very opaque at other frequencies. But so by engineering this differently for different cements for the different annuli, uh, we're hoping that we can really see uh, strong multi-annual inspection. So that's something that we're looking forward to for the uh, application and the ability to demonstrate the tunability of the, uh, of the acoustic smart cement and to use those different flavors in conjunction. Very good. Uh, thank you. I, the question is, how repeatable are the scanite stress measurements? Are they quantitative? Right, yes. So we've been able to quantify the actual degree of loading and the stress state 
uh, mainly for uh, largely only for compressive stress in this um, uh, so far. And uh, we found that the measurements are quite repeatable, and uh, we're currently working to calibrate the measurements for different formulations so that we can actually uh, get that, quanti that, that direct correlation and uh, quantification of the mechanical stress state. In this case, uh, first, uh, the compressive step stress state. Thank you, Jacob. I think the next question is much more on the compositional, um, composition related question and how that affects the rheology and stuff. I'll read the question. How does canide affect cement slurry, rheology, gelation, et cetera? Right. So uh, we've seen uh, no effect on the gelation properties. Um, there is some slight change in the rheology depending on the additive level. Um, but it's not a, a large uh, change and can be controlled with other types of additives. And it doesn't seem to have any effect on the setting time of, of the cement um, and minimal effect on the uh, final uh, compressive strength of the, of the component. Yeah, I think the, the next question is actually connecting to the same question. How does canite, um, you know, incorporating this material, how does it affect the compressive strength of the cement? Because, you know, obviously you don't want to play with the compressive strength that's already there. So that the question comes from that perspective, I believe. How does canite affect the compressive strength? Right. So that's one thing we've been working on is how to balance the additive level to achieve the uh, uh, strong acoustic response. Uh, while not uh, impacting the uh, cement strength or other properties. And what we've found is we can add it at a quite a low level uh, and still get a very strong impact on the acoustic properties that doesn't have a strong impact on the compressive strength. And also, there might be other benefits for incorporating these type of uh, metamaterial particles in terms of impact, uh, impact strength and um, uh, fracture propagation properties it might actually be improved. So we want to look at that further. Indeed, I think the, the name of the game, as we discussed with um, uh, another operator the other day, was that how do you balance between the, the composition, uh, which is how much material that you add, and the economics that's related to it, and then also um, how do you scale up? And as Jacob said, the idea is to actually keep the volume fraction of material that's being added to extremely low and still get a quality performance, and it seems like we can do that at this point. What is the smallest scanite we can produce, and what is the band gap frequency for the smallest particle? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So, um, as I mentioned, we've been continuously uh, reducing the size of these particles, and part of that reason is to control the uh, acoustic band gap frequency. And in this case, for smaller particles, we're looking at uh, the hundreds of kilohertz uh, range of frequency. And that's for uh, particle sizes that can be down to uh, 40, 100 mesh size. So we're talking about down to 100 mesh size. Yeah, so I think so basically we are, we are able to customize to whatever is required and we don't have a huge limitations on the particle size. I see a question here. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Vinod, can I address that? Please. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the question is, in case an operator goes for cold fluid fractional job or a hot fluid fractional job, does it have an effect on the material properties? In short, does scanite get affected due to temperature changes? And I think that's a really good question. And the answer that we've gotten to so far is no. Uh, unlike some of our other sensing cements, like a nanite can be used to easily uh, sense uh, temperature due, using electrical measurements. These acoustic measurements are not largely impacted by uh, temperature changes. And uh, I think that leads to some of the further evaluation that we're doing these with uh, high temperature, high pressure conditions for these materials. So thank you for that question. I wonder what if the mixture cement and uh, nanoparticle is unbalanced? So basically saying that we don't have the perfect one. Some areas have more concentration of nanoparts in the cement versus other with few nanoparticles or few of the scanite particles. Is the measure, um, you know, is it going to impact the measurement? Yeah, so it, it will because largely we're measuring uh, the concentration of these metamaterial particles in the cement. Uh, so if they have uneven distribution, you may actually be able to see that using your measurement system. Um, but we designed these 
particles also to have, as I was mentioning, neutral uh, buoyancy or neutral density with the cement slurry that's being used so that they get very good distribution, uh, just like uh, any other type of uh, additive that's commonly used with cement. Um, but I think the answer is yes, that will impact the measurements, and it might actually be a good thing that you can see that you haven't got well mixed cement uh, distributed throughout your uh, well area. I think there is a question on the um, CSS, um, steam well. The cement integrity in these cases is extremely important, so is it good for CSS application, CSS wells? Yes, I imagine that's uh, actually one of the, uh, could be one of the greatest benefits for continuous monitoring. Uh, so if we can to set up um, a uh, continuous monitoring system for those types of wells. So yes, maybe one of the things that probably you want to add to the audience that I think maybe it didn't come through the presentation clearly is that you're also working on um, potentially another version which is like probably the most game changing is to have the cement to be monitored from the surface. Sure. So I, I think I briefly mentioned a couple of potential avenues for that they were looking at, but one of them would be a um, uh, fiber optic installed um, uh, well or, uh, or part of a well where you can do a continuous acoustic monitoring of the cement um, for, uh, for the, from the surface. And then also uh, methods of using surface pipe excitation um, in order to determine the properties of the cement further down the pipe. Down the pipe. And these, uh, in that case, it would be a more kind of a global uh, measurement uh, there. And so if you see issues in your global measurement, then you might want to go with go in with the interventional tool to get a high resolution mapping of the area of concern. Finally, for maybe potentially more applicable to deep water wells uh, are some acoustic relay systems that have been de developed that actually convey the acoustic signal and uh, information up the uh, steel casing pipe using the, the pipe as a, 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 a kind of a conduit uh, for the relay system. Thank you. Um, one question, Jacob, it is on the, I think this is a question that we've been addressing um, with different uh, operators already. Uh, what kind of chemical additives have you tested can it against for reactivity or degradation? Right, so that's really important and, um, you know, Obviously, we've tested it in an alkaline cement environment, and they uh, have no issues surviving that kind of uh, alkaline harsh environment. And we're also uh, looking at, as I mentioned, the high temperature, high pressure conditions uh, in, it in order to ensure their, the uh, integrity of the material uh, in those cases. Uh, but we have uh, had the uh, pilot field study pipes installed uh, for uh, several years now, and uh, we take sections of that, and there's been no degradation uh, to the particles in this case uh, over over several years. But I think we do need to look a little more closely at um, the uh, chemical conditions. But in 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 some sense, the cement itself protects uh, the uh, could protect the particles themselves from those types of harsh corrosion uh, and those types of things. One, one uh, question that was texted to me um, just now, um, the question is that to tune um, scan I, let's say so we, we discussed about the size versus the, the band gap. To tune the scan I, uh, particles for a certain frequency, do you have to trade off particle density? No, so we're able to actually fine tune the different um, properties of the particles and the layer characteristics. Uh, in order to uh, control those uh, aspects independently. We can achieve uh, different uh, acoustic band gap responses with materials of the same size and density by uh, trading off some of those characteristics. It is interesting because one of the, the questions is related to some of the stuff that we are currently pushing for. Uh, the question is actually internally what we discussed, can um, the scanite particles give an identity of the cement? So, we internally discuss as can the scanite could be a, a DNA of cement, you know. So, so the the answer is yes. Uh, we have the capability of tuning the frequency for uh, different frequency ranges uh, with different uh, customized materials. I don't know, Jacob, if you want to add anything to it. Uh, no, I just uh, no. I think 
Um, it, it's largely related to the multi-annular inspection and having different cemented regions that have distinct acoustic responses uh, based on their composition. I, I think that's what you're referring to, correct? Yeah. Um, another one, what is the highest frequency band gap observed so far for any ultrasonic application developed till the date? Do these scanite particles form a uniform distribution once cured in the matrix? Yes. So um, I mentioned uh, that we've been looking in the hundreds of kilohertz uh, range, um, and that's as far as we've seen so far. Uh, we do believe there may be band gaps at higher frequencies. It's largely limited by our detection methods at this point and kind of our system for measuring it. So being able to get enough acoustic energy through at high frequencies um, and then also looking at, at different uh, modes besides a kind of pass-through mode where we look at reflections uh, and things like that might be able to allow us to detect at higher frequencies. But for now, it's uh, the lower hundreds of thousands of kilohertz. And then about the particle distribution, that's one thing we've worked a lot on is um, trying to ensure that these particles become evenly distributed and don't settle during the cement curing, even if you have an extended curing time. So that's a large issue, uh, especially for uh, a large cemented well, where of course settling could be very detrimental. Uh, so we, we've actually been able to achieve that, and we've demonstrated that uh, through a couple of means, but uh, through just uh, cross-sectioning and visual analysis. But also, once we have very good uh, uniform distribution, that actually enhances the acoustic problem. Can you use the acoustic monitoring technology used to monitor surface facilities for developing cracks for real-time monitoring? Yeah, so that's another mode, potentially, if I'm understanding the question correctly, that we could use for detection, especially of cement near the surface, um, would be in uh, seismic methods, actually, and using something like a surface seismic method to uh, be able to detect the cement stress state during the actually during production without intervening at all and um, one of the challenges here again now we're talking about a totally different um, range of frequencies so very low frequency response and um, we've seen that some of these particles do have we can uh, make engineer them to have a response in the seismic range um, and we're looking at that for other applications but it may actually be useful for monitoring the net from the surface as well uh, so I think that's a very good question if I uh, address that correctly. Also, I want to add, um, Jacob, that you know we are already working some uh, with some international players on the potential application for, for monitoring. Monitoring um, beyond oil and gas, looking at the infrastructure, looking at the sort of health monitoring aspects of infrastructure like bridges and structures and other stuff. Um, another question, I think it's a it's a does the quantity of concentration of scanite affect the band gap frequency? No, so it doesn't. That's what, the, that's what allows us to do these kind of independent measurements of stress and presence or concentration. It's because we can measure the concentration and the band gap amplitude changes with concentration, but the frequency itself shifts with mechanical load. So that, that, the, the answer is no, and that's the reason that we're able to do these independent type measurements simultaneously. Um, another question online, if you have CCA leak, what might affect quality of scanite, like water, oil, and gas uh, leaking, uh, salinity, H2S, hydrocarbons? So basically, external factors that could impact the measurement. Right. So that's where we're looking at those, those harsh, more harsh conditions um, to determine if their migration through the cement, even without a leak, could cause issues or uh, alter the uh, response of the scanite, but I, I think it actually leads to uh, a very interesting topic, which is to use these materials not just for um, mechanical detection, but some kind of chemical detection, where the acoustic response uh, does vary based on things like H2S, and we can measure that uh, using this type of system. So using that, if there isn't a change uh, in the scanite response due to the presence of these types of things, can we measure that remotely? So the, the other question, so just to add to what Jacob is saying, so there is an, actually an interest from um, different players in looking at the impact of the acoustic response based on the chemicals, because I think some of these chemicals, what we were told is that it is, these are known chemicals or known um, 
foreign materials that comes in contact with the cement. So in the event um, there is any chemical uh, reaction can be detected. So it is something that we, we are exploring, not something that we have completed. So we have some tests going on, just looking at the acoustic monitoring, but looking at the chemical um, um, chemistry-based monitoring, we haven't completed that yet. Um, another um, question, uh, what percentage canide needs to be added to cement to have a measurable effect? Right, that's another good question. And uh, we've seen responses down to a couple of percent uh, weight percent additive. Uh, so, you know, like a 2% additive, we've seen actually a, a, a not only a detectable acoustic response, but a significant acoustic difference in uh, response. Um, however, for uh, the applications that we're looking at, most of them we're looking at uh, additive levels from five to 10%. Um, and again, it is a dose dependent effect. So um, you get you can get a stronger signal uh, by adding more par particles. So we're trying to balance that for different applications. So this uh, next question, I think actually, so it just goes to the, the, the point that I was making before for other potential infrastructure applications. And I think one of the works that actually you're, you're working with an international player already. So the question goes like, uh, do you have a non-cement version of the technology? Uh, perhaps something that could be painted on um, in potential uh, applications in nuclear and other industries? Yeah, so that's something that we have uh, looked into is uh, making uh, coatings or paints with these types of properties. And uh, we do have it in non-cement formulations uh, that can still be either structural or non-structural. So we've, we've seen this effect very strong in uh, things like epoxies and polyurethane when, uh, when acoustic metamaterial particles are added to them. Um, and then uh, also silicone. So looking at you know, maybe latex paints and using them as additives for them. And uh, it, it's a very good point because these materials are not only useful for acoustic sensing, but also sound control and uh, noise mitigation. How does microannulus affect the measurement and has this been quantified? So I think it goes right. to the void uh, discussion that we had. Yeah, that's something that, we, uh, that we, we want to look at more in the field, definitely, and that'll provide us with the opportunity to do that. But we have looked at through modeling and kind of subscale, mo uh, subscale physical, through computer modeling and subscale physical models, um, we've created a variety of defects, um, whether they're cracks through the cement or uh, annular defects at the cement, at the case cement casing interface, or at the uh, uh, cement formation interface. So there, we we definitely showed that we can uh, detect these kind of defects more clearly. It will become much more clear when we can do that in an actual well situation uh, where we have more control over pipe pressure. Uh, and uh, and actually causing a microannulus to be able to measure its effect. Um, so with that, I think the Q and A session wraps up. If you have more questions and if you want to have specific discussions with different groups within your organization, or you want to have a conversation with um, you know uh, with Oceanet on any of the concept of operations for deployment uh, or the possibilities for partnering please do let us know. Uh, you have my email ID, and because I sent you invite to everybody. You have my email ID. If you have any trouble, you can also go to the info at oceanic.com. Also here, as you can see, flashed on the screen, this is a, a microsite that we put together with all the information there, scanite.io. Uh, you could visit that website as well to find more information. So to wrap up the session, uh, personally, I want to thank everybody. I think it is a great session. We had, as I said, we have about 75 people and everybody stayed on. Really, really appreciate you staying through the entire, entire time on the webinar. So um, the last thing uh, to wrap this up, um, I wanted to bring again uh, our CEO back to the, I don't know, Pat, can you hear us? So maybe you can wrap up the session. Thank you. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Bill and the Department of Energy and Honey at and Shell and uh, Vinod and Jacob and the team for doing a great job. Uh, the thing too to understand is we've been working on uh, smart materials for years. So we actually build all kinds of weird sensors from engineering DNA to quantum 
thoughts to uh, a variety of nano applications. And in this case, what's nice about this is that, you know, we're, we're really bringing it to scale and an industrial scale. And the thing I like about the energy industry is everything is really big. And so we worked really hard to get it to scalability, reliability, so that from a quality standpoint, it can be scaled up. Uh, what you saw today was what we call Metascale manufacturing, which then you work out a lot of these details and you can then make it much bigger. So there's so much more to talk about here, but I just want to thank again, everybody for joining, uh, for making the time and Vinod, um, another, you know, Vinod's uh, uh, a, a real superstar and uh, appreciate uh, what you're doing here. So anyway, thank you everybody and uh, look forward to working with you. I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation on Scanite. We are now going to conclude Oceanit Spark Day on Scanite Smart Sensing Cement. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and participating in the Q&A section. If you have further questions or comments, please reach out to your point of contact at Oceanit. Thank you and have a good day.